<coughs> pardon me, concerning the Israeli elections and Netanyahu. Now, uh, Netanyahu, of course, qualifies as a warmonger demagogue, and he uh, shamelessly engages in displays of racism uh, vis-a-vis the Arab citizens of Israel. There are Arab Israelis um, who represent a significant political bloc in the uh, parliament there, the Knesset. Uh, Netanyahu, obviously uh, a racist and uh, at the same time someone who has built his political career on war and the threat of war. Now, this is intolerable, and we have to remember that the only reason that that Netanyahu can do these things is because he gets this three and a half billion dollar subsidy from the United States uh, in terms of military aid and other aid. Uh, remember that the the Iron Dome, which uh, with this, the anti missile system that has allowed the most recent uh, excesses by Netanyahu was also a joint project with the U.S. and heavily funded by the U.S. So the question now arises uh, how to restrain, how to uh, mute the excesses of Netanyahu. Because remember, this is now an attempt to drag the United States into war really on two fronts, right? One is the Iranian front where he has been focusing with his demagogy in his uh, speech to the U.S. Congress, and then also vis-a-vis the Palestinians. Um, The Iran demagogy we've discussed in previous weeks, but now concerning the Palestinians, on the eve of the election, as everybody now knows, uh, Netanyahu said, if you create a Palestinian state, uh, then you're simply uh, creating a playground for uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalist extremists, and uh, the the question then: Does that mean that you that under your prime ministership there won't be a Palestinian state? The answer, indeed. Now, after having harvested, having reaped the fruits <coughs> of that demagogy, Netanyahu then attempted to reverse his field in the famous interview with Andrea Mitchell uh, on the day after the vote, saying, I have not changed my policy. I don't want a one-state solution. I want a two-state solution, but it has to be uh, viable and with security guarantees and all this. Now, of course, (laughs) from the point of view of the insider, I suppose, or just an outsider who knows something, that I guess would be my attempt, uh, it's true, he hasn't changed his policy. Everybody always knew that Netanyahu was a warmonger and that he was inalterably opposed to peace because he's built his political career on the opposite. So there really is nothing new. Uh, the point is, though, that he has now made it impossible for his enablers in the U.S., in the State Department, and the Obama administration, even his enablers can now not defend what he's done because he says, well, we're, we're not going to have a Palestinian state. I have not had a chance to, to look it all up, but the, the idea of a Palestinian state uh, was at least implicit in the Camp David Accords of Carter and uh, Begin and Sadat in uh, 1978. And... Uh, it was explicit in the Oslo Accords that were celebrated at the White House by Bill Clinton uh, with uh, uh, Rabin and uh, Arafat uh, in, what, 94, I guess it must have been. Uh, and we've had others, right? We've had Y River. We've had other uh, interim uh, agreements. The, the entire bedrock of the entire policy uh, really can only be the two-state Solution, right? This also grows out of UN uh, resolutions 242 and so forth, right? So um, there's no doubt that the two state solution is indispensable. It's the only one that would ever work, right? Uh, and that is go- that goes against the various extremist radicals who want the one state solution and then the the demographic uh, takeover, right? Which um, it would would obviously generate many other problems. 
So, uh, by saying this, Netanyahu has exposed himself. He was essentially a crypto warmonger, if you want, if you were willfully blind. But now uh, he's now an open uh, warmonger. So this makes it impossible uh, to uh, to support him. I would also add, maybe a little bit more substantively, from the U.S. Uh, population point of view, the idea of forcing this country into a war with Iran, which could easily become a war with others. Let's not even speculate which others, but there are others, and you can imagine who. <coughs> Those are very, very dangerous activities, and they're intolerable. So... Um, you know that I have uh, long um, contemplated and to some degree endorsed the idea. It's really the same idea that, that Franklin D. Roosevelt had in 1944 and 1945 concerning the United Nations, right? The Security Council, as FDR put it, was the five policemen. And the idea was you would have an international regime of peace and security – that could uh, act against threats, and you can act in, in a number of ways. Um, I think it is time for some of these smaller countries to be restrained and to be uh, essentially guided, no lanes, volanes, right, willy-nilly, towards these peaceful solutions. In other words, it is intolerable for a petty tin pot demagogue in a tiny country to threaten the peace of the world in this way, to say nothing of the humiliation to the United States and, and all the rest of it. But the main thing is the peace of the world. So I actually suggest uh, if we had a Russian-U.S. condominium, it would be fairly easy to say to Israel thus far and no farther to say to China, uh, you know, cool it on those islands. That's going to be somehow mediated to say to Ukraine, cool it, uh, time to pull in your horns and so forth. Um, that sounds a bit utopian. I don't think it is. That was the other big idea of Franklin D. Roosevelt was that within that world of the five policemen, you could have uh, a special U.S. Russian condominium that would allow precisely problems like this to be dealt with. In other words, the general outlines of the peace accord are clear. They are codified in the fall 2003 Geneva Accords of Yossi Balin and Yasser Abed Rabo, done, what, 12 years ago now? And uh, they're clear. We won't go through them now. Go and look at them. Uh, those are the ones that I more or less uh, endorse, although I always want to make sure you add the Marshall Plan for the Middle East. I spent some time contemplating Netanyahu's objection to see if it was fair, because on, on the surface he seems to have a case. When he says, if you had an independent Palestinian <coughs> state, then uh, ISIS would be there, Al Qaeda would be there, and I have come to the conclusion that that is uh, not a valid explanation for reasons which I will tell you in just a minute. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So, what to do about Netanyahu? Um, my recommendation to Obama would be the following. In a confidential way, through diplomatic channels, behind closed doors, communicate to the Israeli government and to the elite of Israel through personal contacts, that Netanyahu is simply unacceptable. The form that this could take is a veto. Veto Netanyahu. Announce the uh, conclusion of the United States government that the paramount fundamental national interests of the United States are outrageously threatened by Netanyahu as an individual, as a demagogue, as a person, a warmonger, a focus of uh, subversive activities, activities subversive of international peace and security. And therefore, Netanyahu is not acceptable to the United States as the prime minister. And with all due respect to these elections, uh, we know that the Israeli elections are 
exorbitantly uh, influenced by people like Sheldon Adelson and other rich Americans who always come down on the side of the warmonger, the reactionary, the provocateur, the uh, exponent of bluster and aggression, and so forth. And in our generation, that's been this uh, Netanyahu. He's unacceptable. Now, there are two orders of leverage to back this up. One, of course, is the diplomatic one. Uh, it's long been the case that the United States has been the only barrier between the outrage of the rest of the world, and that's the only way to put it, the rest of the world, with almost no exceptions, and uh, people like Netanyahu. So, indeed, in the Security Council, it would be good to see an early raising of this question, should there be a Palestinian state, and therefore have the UN Security Council vote for it. The United States, of course, can abstain abstain, but not veto it. And with that, it will go through, because even the British and the French are going to vote for it, depending on, of course, on how it's phrased. But generally speaking, they will vote for it. The other uh, line of uh, leverage, of course, is the $3.5 billion in aid given by the United States to Israel. Um, it might be time to slow down on some of those deliveries, right? It might be a good time to manifest uh, this uh, view, this finding that Netanyahu is a threat to world peace as an individual, right? just as, as a person. And he must no longer be allowed to have access to these levers of, uh, of power. I think it is time to say that um, these smaller countries with unstable politics and demagogic uh, leaders, right? In other words, you look at you look at Ukraine, right? The whole policy is based on politics of the country is based on Russophobia. We cannot allow that to interfere with the peace of the world and impose a world war on the United States because we don't want a world war. We are sick of war and we're not taking it anymore. <laughs> and that would go for Netanyahu and that would go for some others, too. And I would urge uh, anybody involved in those little islands there in the South China Sea to also back off, be it Japan or China, Vietnam, um, Taiwan, uh, all, please, back off. The United States will not be a party to this. On the other hand, we also will uh, severely frown on people coming in there because Japan is, is after all, right there. Um, what is, is it unprecedented? Well, no, it used to be you know, with elections, there used to be elections with a veto. Uh, the papal conclaves. Hey, the papal conclave, for example, of 1903, only yesterday, 100 years ago, a little bit more. Uh, the papal conclave of, of 1903, uh, the leading candidate was an Italian cardinal called Rampolla. Rampolla, he was the secretary of state in the Vatican. He was a disciple of the outgoing, uh, then deceased pope, Leo the Thirteenth. He was the mentor of Benedict the Fifteenth, the Pope that came after him. But this series was interrupted when the Cardinal of, uh, I think, of Galicia, actually, uh, but in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Cardinal of Krakow, I believe, uh, got up and read a veto message from Franz Josef, the Emperor of Austria, saying that the election of Rampolla is unacceptable to the Austrian Empire. And, of course, the Spanish king, the French king, and the Austrian emperor had long uh, asserted this right uh, to, uh, to a veto, even though it was contested. Rampolla was considered pro-French <coughs> as a result, <coughs> pardon me, as a result of the, um, of this veto. Uh, Rampolla was not elected. And we had Pius X, and I think this is a negative page in the history of the papacy, Pius X and his cardinal, Marie del Val, who was his uh, secretary, at, uh, secretary of state. All right, so here's an example of a veto. This one turned out poorly, but uh, I think a veto of uh, Netanyahu could turn out to be quite, uh, quite um, positive, if only in the sense that it would – Avoid the worst, because what's he going to do now? Um, will there be a new intifada? 
Uh, will the Palestinians rise up? Will the PLO be overthrown? Remember, the PLO is based completely on this idea that you can have a negotiated solution. And now Netanyahu says essentially, I fooled you for 20 years. Well, you didn't fool anybody, but everybody played along. Now you've made it impossible for them to play along. And uh, and what's left? Will there be violence? Will there be, again, a new intifada? Will Hamas and its movement of despair and the Muslim Brotherhood spread into the West Bank? I certainly hope not. But that's the kind of thing that can happen uh, here. OK, now, changing gears, we've got to talk about currency chaos and the international financial system. We have just been through a wild roller coaster week. Uh, you're aware that the moneyed power, right, the power of organized greed, the power of organized money has been pressing the intellectually weak uh, leadership of the Federal Reserve under Janet Yellen. And remember, as subliminal man would say, topply for fethead, topply for fethead. Uh, Yellen, obviously uh, not capable of carrying out this job, has been making verbal concessions that they're going to raise um, interest rates. Uh, this is uh, supreme folly. Uh, if, if, if they raise interest rates and that's all they do, and that's all they are going to do, uh, you're going to get a very, very serious uh, outbreak of world economic depression, as we've seen with the currency chaos of this past week. Dollar down against the euro 2% one day and then up 2% the next day. Back in a minute.